you go through the report in sections, uh, about 10 minutes each. And then uh, when they finish, um, I'm very hopeful that that will be very much to time. And then we've got a good 20 minutes for any comments you might have, any questions, any thoughts that are arising from that. So a few kind of admin ground rules at the very beginning. Um, as the computer has just said, the meeting is being recorded um, and the slides that the team will be using will be provided to all of you at the end of the session. So there's no need to spend a lot of time uh, writing furiously. Uh, you will get all the slides. Now we're using the Zoom webinar function. And as you can see, you've got a Q&A tab available to you. Um, if you think of questions as we're going through the presentations, please uh, post your questions uh, on the platform uh, and we'll answer as many as we can do at the end of the event. So we won't do it as we go along, but we'll do it at the end. So please get thinking uh, and writing questions. That would be great. Um, if you are a, a Twitter user, can you use the hashtag, hashtag Crest County Lines, which is up on the screen to discuss the webinar and, and clearly to ask uh, any further questions. So hopefully that's all the admin. Um, and I thought I would just say uh, some words uh, of introduction. I've also written the forward uh, for the report and this very much uh, echoes my thoughts uh, as explained in the forward. I think all of you, because you're experts that are joining this call, will know that the exploitation of children in county line drug dealing has developed significantly uh, in recent years. And as that's happened, of course, the response has gradually improved. Um, identification of victims of these crimes is much better. And there's been, of course, a significant increase in operations to target offenders. But while we can all point to improvements, and a lot of you have been involved in that, I think we'd also all agree that much more needs to be done. And as I was thinking about what I might say today, of course, you know, this really has grown in importance. Even the former prime minister, Boris Johnson, got involved. I see that in uh, one of his last uh, actions in his last week in office was to go on a raid in London against alleged county line offenders. And um, I think this isn't the first time he did it. In fact, I, I remember, was it last year he got uh, us all quite surprised, I think, when he said that 1,500 county line gangs had been rolled up. And we all thought, well, well some good work going on, but that seems like a lot. Of course, what he was referring to was the number of deal lines, not the number of gangs, of course, as ever, he didn't get intent it intentionally wrong. So this report, um, which I really welcome, for me, when I read it, and I, I'm sure you will all feel the same, it just shines a very bright light on the damage done to young lives, but also just how complex the challenges are if we're gonna respond effectively. Um, but importantly, it makes some good and sensible recommendations. What's often struck me about county lines, having a background, as I said, in policing is that the criminal justice system tends to see individuals, uh, indeed children, as either a victim or an offender. And of course, the challenge of county lines drug dealing is that individuals may be found offending, but are often in reality victims. And I think this report illustrates just how difficult it can be to make that judgment. And the absence of clear guidance for frontline staff exacerbates that difficulty. Um, you know, the case, cases uh, in the study show that identification of victims is improving. Uh, and this is corroborated by the increase we've seen, the massive increase in referrals to the national referral mechanism. However, it strikes me uh, when I read this report and just by what I know about what happens on the ground, uh, even when children are identified, the absence of effective safeguarding interventions is a, is a real concern. And I think that practical, um, example that comes up a couple of times in the report that when you have got a victim who owes hundreds of pounds to unscrupulous criminals you know how do you begin to deal with it it truly is i think a wicked problem so this study uh, looks in depth at the lives of 13 boys and and all of them have been subject to trauma and damage in their young lives before they were criminally exploited 
And I know this isn't a statistically significant sample, but I think it was really interesting that of the boys that we looked at in depth, that Crest looked at in depth, actually all have been subject to trauma and damaged uh, in their young lives before they were exploited. And I was particularly struck by the extent of domestic violence that experienced and the frequency in which serious sexual abuse appeared in their backgrounds. And you know, it made me think that you know, the dealers, the line holders are clearly targeting you know, very vulnerable children where there are very, very few protective factors present. And of course, many of you will know that the child protection regime in the United Kingdom is very much viewed from a, a lens of familial harm, that that's where the harm uh, comes from in respect to children. But in these cases, the harm largely, not completely, but largely comes from outside the family. And of course, contextual safeguarding interventions, what can we do to manage that environment are so much less developed. Um, they are certainly underfunded. And I think viewed as optional in many cases, there are fewer powers and fewer tools, I think, uh, to, to use to protect children. And so my view in this report only corroborates it is that a step change in the system response is needed. And that's not to criticize any practitioner, but I just think the the hopelessness of that cycle is very palpable in this report. In most cases in this report, the children were living with their families. Uh, where they weren't, uh, there were real concerns about the quality of care provided by the state. Um, and the report uses the term exiling children from their neighborhoods um, in order to protect them and, and recommends that children should only be housed a maximum of 20 miles away from their home. And I think that's a really interesting recommendation because uh, when I was working as commissioner, many experts would observe the fact that there was so much damage done by removing a child away from family, friendship groups and potential guardians. They might be physically away from the danger, but actually a lot of the potential protective factors, the protected potential safeguarding uh, folk were also uh, hundreds of miles away sometimes. So as a, a former anti-slavery commissioner, you know, in some ways it's very encouraging that criminal exploitation is clearly being identified as a form of human trafficking. And that in most of these cases, there is a referral into the national referral mechanism. But of course, we all know that means a child is then in a system where there are lengthy, lengthy delays in coming to determination about whether the child is indeed uh, a victim. And the report calls out uh, this as a policy failure, and I would completely uh, support that observation. Importantly, the report also points to the solution, uh, which is local decision-making for children, which is something that I supported all the time I was in office. Um, this is currently subject to a successful pilot, which has been extended, um, and has resulted in significantly more timely decision making, but also more assured decision making by local operational agencies. Uh, and I really do hope the evidence in this report gives even greater momentum to that local approach so that it not just in 10 pilot areas or 20 pilot areas, but that we have it uh, introduced across the country. And lastly, uh, before I hand over to the team, what struck me as I read this report was not only the extreme exploitation of children, but also the dedication of frontline staff doing their very best in what are clearly really difficult situations. The arresting police officers who, despite um, much evidence, they don't have much evidence, um, no disclosure sometimes and little time to investigate are really endeavoring to do the right thing to protect vulnerable children and to bring to justice those who exploit them and also the social workers and the exploitation specialists who are persevering in supporting severely traumatized children despite the fact that those children were often very understandably lacking any confidence in those professionals and so can i just say i know a lot of you are listening in today 
Um, sometimes, you know, this work is really, really tough. In fact, probably most of the time it is. You are at the forefront of trying to break the cycle of this county line uh, phenomena. And thank you for that. And hopefully this report will encourage you because uh, you're not alone. And there are lots of people trying to do uh, a really important job in difficult circumstances. And with that uh, introduction, I'm now going to hand over to the Crest team, to Beth and Joe and Jess. Over to you, team. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I'm Beth. I'm going to take you, I'm a senior analyst at Crest, and I'm going to take you through the research questions on our approach. So the research sought to answer two key questions. Um, the first was how are decisions made as to whether children and young people involved in county lines should be treated as victims of child criminal exploitation? And secondly, how do key agencies, in this case, police and local authorities, respond to young people when it's heavily suspected or known that they're involved in county lines? In order to answer these two research questions, our project involved various stages of research. There was a preliminary research phase to establish key questions in the area and set the parameters for our primary research. This included the two roundtables Sarah mentioned and a deep dive into Project Adder and the NRM localization pilot. There was then a primary research phase which centered around 13 case studies. This is largely what the findings in our report are based on and what we'll cover today. We selected a case study approach because having a small in-depth sample is invaluable to understanding decision making, which is contextual and relies on an in-depth understanding of the circumstances. This level of insight could not be gathered from a large data set where descriptive detail would be lost. We also wanted to understand young people's involvement in county lines in the context of their whole lives. To do that, we had to match police and local authority data, which we couldn't do on a large scale. In doing so, we are bringing together information across the life course of the young people in a way that isn't routinely done by police or local authorities or researchers. In order to find the case studies, we approached two importer police forces and asked them to identify 10 young people who were known to be involved in county lines. For them to be sure that a young person was involved in county lines, there had to be an incident which linked them to it. In most cases, this incident was a drugs related arrest. In a handful of cases, it was intel held by the police, most often following a disclosure. Whatever we refer to the term incident throughout this presentation, that is what we mean. We had some other criteria. So the young people in our sample had to be under 18 at the time of the incident, and all of the criminal proceedings linked to the incident had to have concluded so we could understand what happened to them after. In order to access the data, we set up data share agreements between ourselves, the police and the local authorities. The police sent us data, which was anonymized. Then they contacted the local authority with the young person's real name. The local authority then also sent us data, which was anonymized. Throughout this entire process, we never knew, and we still don't know the young person's identity. Any names used in this presentation or indeed the report are pseudonyms. All data was shared via a secure email platform to ensure there was no risk to anonymity. In order to gather data, um, police forces and local authorities were asked to complete an audit template which asked for high level information about the young people. The audit templates for each agency were structured by before the incident, at the time of the incident and after the incident to ensure we built a picture of the young person over time. For the police, the audit template asked them to report things like flags against the young person. So that might be for something like a weapons offence or county lines involvement. For the local authority, they were asked to report why the young person was first known to children's social care, for example, and any key flags they had on their system. So that might be things like substance misuse, mental health concerns and domestic abuse. After this, we conducted 37 interviews with police officers and local authority practitioners to really understand the decisions that were made. For police officers, the interviews were conducted with arresting officers where possible. Where that wasn't possible, we spoke to officers heavily involved in each case. From local authorities, we spoke to a range of social workers, youth justice workers and exploitation case workers. For most young people, we spoke to about two or three local authority practitioners, but in some cases it was as many as five. This gave us in-depth data on our sample of 13 young people. You can see from this infographic, most of the incidents are arrests for drug related offences, but there are three cases where the incidents involved police intel, which often followed a disclosure. 
We didn't request any specific demographic criteria for the young people selected by the two police forces. It's worth noting, however, that all of the young people selected by the police forces to be included in our sample were male. Based on police assigned IC codes, eight of the young people in the sample were white, three were black and two were Asian. It's important to note that police assigned codes represent how police officers perceive the ethnicity of an individual and are not necessarily how the individual would identify themselves. Given the small sample size, to protect the anonymity of the young people, their ethnicity is not specified. The incident which acts as the focal part of the research typically occurred when the boys were between 15 and 16 years old. Before we move into the findings, I just want to flag a trigger warning. This report and our presentation today includes references to drug and alcohol abuse, familial and extrafamilial sexual abuse, domestic violence and extrafamilial violence, which some may find upsetting. I'm now going to pass to Joe to give you a summary of the key findings and recommendations. Okay, thanks a lot, Beth. Um, so I'm Joe Plurry, uh, and I'm Head of Research and Policy at Crest Advisory. So I lead our, our Think Tank program. Um, County Lines is an issue that's been close to my heart for a very long time. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk you through um, some of the key findings and recommendations, and we'll get into more of the detail that lies behind them, especially the case study evidence um, further in the, in the presentation. So first of all, on um, early intervention and prevention, um, as you'll hear, the young people in our study, sadly, have led incredibly difficult lives and have experienced things that no child should ever experience. However, it's not possible for a local authority to regard every um, child who is vulnerable as a potential victim of CCE and therefore target an expensive intervention at them. But what we found from our case studies is that there's a, a, a mechanism, if you like, in which vulnerability interacts with context making contextual safeguarding issues more important. And that includes uh, context uh, online as well as um, uh, uh, in the real world. So, you know, uh, as much a WhatsApp group as a park. Um, so we found that there are a lot of tools available to local authorities now to take an approach like this, that, that uh, has that appreciation of the interaction of vulnerability and context schools have a big role to play, yachts have a big role to play. Um, and also with the missing incidents, although uh, areas are getting better at understanding missing incidents, um, uh, a lot more could be done to understand the, the possible risks of exploitation within patterns of missing where duration or frequency change rapidly. Um, so next, I wanted to go on to the, the arrest bit, I suppose. Uh, for most of our, our, our children were arrested rather than identified. Uh, and this is tricky. Um, I think the view that we've formed is that there's more or less a two-tier system for police and county lines. There are big national and regional operations like Orochi um, who have access to huge resources and are able to uh, uh, um, uh, do really deep work with perpetrators and break apart lines um, and return large numbers of children to their families. But every day there are police forces who are not operating in that way, who don't have access to those resources, who are still tasked with, with county lines work and, and understandably so because county lines blight their communities, could be properties, um, uh, children from out of area turning up, uh, you know, the harms are well known of county lines. It's not a problem that can be ignored, but when they arrest the young people, how on earth are they to, to, to decide whether or not they are a victim of exploitation? A willing participant in drug dealing, uh, a young gangster who loves the lifestyle, um, or if they're a groomer themselves who are just pretending that they're a victim um, in order to escape uh, a prosecution. Um, so the idea that uh, uh, an, anyone under the age of 18 is capable of coordinating a criminal conspiracy across borders, I think would, would strike most people as a fairly exceptional um, happening. 
Um, we've reached a situation where the NRM has become our diagnostic tool. So um, it, it's expected that children in county lines will be referred into um, the NRM uh, for a reasonable grounds judgment. But then they're waiting 400 days or more for um, a, a, a conclusive grounds judgment. And in that time, they can be um, uh, re-exploited or um, harmed in other ways. They tend to be put back into the same toxic family environments and failing care placements that they were in before. Um, so uh, the NRM is absolutely failing young people in county lines. Um, uh, and the localization we've found is a, a, a possible sign of hope. Um, so we think as well, the CPS could do more in this area, the Crown Prosecution Service, um, in other areas of, of, of crime, um, such as Razo issues, they offer more intensive and early advice with police on how to judge whether a young person is uh, culpable, um, what could be done. Uh, and we think that there is real potential for doing some of that here. But the main recommendation we're making is that any child arrested for county lines related offences where there's not clear evidence that they are culpable of drug dealing um, uh, willingly, um, if they are 100 days shy of their 18th birthday or younger, which is a, a cutoff set by the Home Office, uh, in, the S, in the SEA localization program. They should be returned to their local area for what essentially is a crisis intervention. So we agree with uh, Dame Sarah that the localization pilots of the NRM have been successful. We looked at one in an earlier long read in London, working really well and well beyond its remit. So we think that these panels by bringing together senior people in specialist roles can offer a crisis intervention for those young people, keeping them safe from harm and also deterring um, exploiters from trying to extract debts from them or threatening them. Um, the difficulty is, of course, that even with the most intensive plan, uh, it's possible that uh, the young person, uh, and we, we, you know, we talk about the fluidity of the victim offender situation um, uh, and, and the mindset of the exploited person, young person, they may seek to return to their exploiter. So we're suggesting something like a safeguarding order, which would provide uh, a route for local panels to go to court and ask for controls to prevent the young person being re-exploited. And these could in include electronic tagging um, or secure accommodation. And the final thing I'll say on that um, is when these young people are returned to the local areas, um, uh, we know from previous research uh, around 20% are, uh, are, are in care. Um, the idea that exile is a solution for exploitation is nonsensical and has been proven to be wrong and harmful. So we don't believe that children should be sent hundreds of miles away from all of the protective factors in their lives after they've been exploited. It's an invitation for them to be re-exploited, um, unless this is a choice that they themselves make to protect themselves. So we think that ending this exile approach um, uh, is crucial. And this mirrors a finding of Josh McAllister's uh, um, excellent care review. Um, this will require an investment. So there are uh, a lot of difficult things to hear in this report, but it, I think it's important to approach it with some optimism in that we have found a lot of the tools are there to do the work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, on that note, I will hand over um, to my colleague to carry on. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Um, hi, my name is Jess. I am an analyst at Crest Advisory and a member of the research team. I'm going to talk you through our research findings related to the vulnerabilities and contextual risks present in the lives of the 13 young people prior to the identifying incident. Um, and that is the incident that identified their involvement in county lines. Children in need of additional help are thankfully a small proportion of the general population, but constitute a majority of the children involved in county lines. 
And as Dame Sarah alluded to in her introduction, there is a pattern of vulnerability evident across our 13 cases. Um, and the slide um, that you'll see up there demonstrates the distribution of this vulnerability. The first thing to note is that all of the 13 young people um, misused substances prior to the identifying incident. Um, as the table shows, 12 had previous offending behaviours and eight had been victims of crime. The vast majority of the young people had been reported missing prior to the incident. 10 had witnessed, experienced, or in some cases perpetrated domestic abuse, including being a witness or being the victim of sexual abuse in some cases. Nine were involved in gangs and seven of the young people had been excluded from school. So as I mentioned, this table um, shows the distribution of vulnerability across our sample of 13 young people. And the rows highlighted in red there represent vulnerabilities that were the most prevalent in this sample. It's likely that many of these vulnerabilities, either in isolation or in tandem, resulted in trauma for these young people. And just to um, clarify, these were only the risks and vulnerabilities that were recorded and known about prior to the incident. Next slide, please, Anna. The extent of vulnerability across the sample is striking, as Dame Sarah mentioned. One practitioner interviewed for this research explicitly referred to these vulnerabilities as push factors, vulnerabilities that make young people especially susceptible to exploitation. The practitioner explained that these are factors which push young people out of safe and healthy settings and into the hands of gangs who are ready to exploit them. These push factors were present in domestic and contextual settings, although familial risk often preceded contextual risk. However, in every case, these risks were entangled and entrenched in the lives of these young people. For Joshua, who was one of the 13 young people in our sample, the family home was not a stable environment and violent incidents were not uncommon. There was a history of domestic abuse between Joshua's parents and an indication also that Joshua was violent towards his parents. His biological dad and his older brothers were known to police and involved in criminality. Joshua went missing regularly, but his family didn't always report his missing episodes and practitioners reflected that there was an acceptance that this is what he does. The practitioners working with Joshua noted that he felt like the odd one out in his family and didn't get the, the uh, emotional support that he needed. Joshua had very low self-esteem and he would seek validation in associations outside the home and often with older males who showed interest in him. John is another young person in the sample. He first became known to children's social care when he was less than a year old. Um, and at the age of six, he became a looked after child following concerns of neglect. He'd been exposed to domestic abuse in the home um, and had witnessed parental substance misuse. At the age of eight, John was on a full care order and had moved through more than 10 placements in two years. And many of those placements were unsuitable. They included holiday lets and unregistered care placements, which would have created instability for John and a lack of reliable protective networks. John went missing regularly and practitioners described how he would constantly seek friends and really struggled with his identity. By the time John was arrested in the identifying incident at the age of 15, he was well known to police and had already been arrested on approximately 20 occasions. He'd also witnessed a sexual assault. Both John and Joshua, like many of the young people in the sample, were exposed to violence and exploitative relationships from a very young age and this would have become the norm for them. Where push factors aren't present, where young people do feel safe and secure, it's much harder for criminals to exploit them. Next slide, please, Anna. The risk of exploitation is increased, as Jay mentioned, where vulnerability in the domestic setting is met with contextual risk, gang involvement and offending. However, we found that children, child protective services, sorry, continue to prioritize risk within the home at the expense of extra familial risks faced by vulnerable young people. Our report recommends teams such as children's social care, home police forces and youth offending teams dealing with vulnerable young people should embrace contextual safeguarding approaches, which involve a greater appreciation of extra familial risk. The young people in our sample 
all had significant needs and vulnerabilities, even trauma prior to the identifying incident. They should have been visible to services. Yet yeah, reviewing the data and speaking to practitioners for this research, in many cases, we found a tragically predictable pattern of vulnerability, which escalated to a critical point without meaningful intervention. Of course, in some cases where children and young people are not on the radar of services, it can be very difficult to intervene early. But where there are signs, where risks such as those prevalent in the sample are flagged, and especially where they're flagged in tandem, agencies must respond to warning signs and act early to reduce the risk of exploitation. The points on this slide are recommendations made in the report on the ways police, local authorities, and other agencies can act to reduce that risk early. They include, as Joe alluded to, a crisis response to significant missing episodes, something that didn't always happen for the young people in our sample, and an end to exile, that is care placements for vulnerable young people 20 miles or more from their home area or in unregistered or semi-independent settings. I'm now going to hand back to my colleague, Beth, who is going to discuss the police response to young people in the sample during and following the identifying incident. Thank you, Jess. So police officers are critical in determining whether a young person involved in county lines is viewed as a victim of exploitation or not. While on the scene of the incident, they gather key evidence which factors into understandings of the young person's culpability and ultimately the extent to which they are seen as a victim of exploitation or not. Our interviews sought to get behind the decision process of police officers. In many cases, they never explicitly considered what it was that made them think a young person was a victim or not. In unpacking this decision process, these are all the factors the police officers described thinking about. I'm gonna focus on a couple here. The first two factors police officers described thinking about is how or why they first identified the young person. They also thought about what evidence they found on or near the young person at the scene of the incident. In our sample, the incidents often followed a missing episode. Where this was the case, most police officers described being aware that a safeguarding response was likely required in addition to any criminal pr processes. However, they responded, how they responded when they first came into contact with a young person on the scene of the incident was determined by the evidence they gathered at the scene of the incident. Officers typically describe finding cash, drugs and or burner phones as evidence of drug related criminal activity. One police officer explained that once you get into the scene, even where your primary intention is to safeguard, you absolutely have to open up your eyes to the evidence in front of you. In most cases, this initial decision process led to an arrest. The decision to arrest was not necessarily a reflection of whether the police officers had decided the young person was indeed culpable for the drug-related offending. Rather, it provided an opportunity to get the young person out of the situation they were in. In many cases, this was a cuckooed address and allow for further consideration of their potential exploitation. Most officers felt they had no other tools at their disposal in these situations. In order to further consider the exploitation element, police officers talked a lot about the person's age. Police officers were aware that the young people in our sample were under the age of 18. Where a young person was under the age of 18, police officers were more likely to see them as potential victims of exploitation. However, none of them felt that this alone automatically indicated that they were indeed victims. Rather, most officers agreed that vulnerability to exploitation stemmed from their position and role within the dealing structure. Understandings of their role within the dealing structure sometimes were linked to age. For example, where a young person was found at an address with much older people, they were deemed to be a victim. For example, Max, one of the case studies we looked at in this report, was arrested aged 14 um, at a known drugs address address with two adults much, much older than him. And on those grounds, he was considered to be a victim of exploitation. Where police officers described scenarios involving young people over the age of 18, they were much, mess, much less likely to, thought of it, to think of them as victims. Reflections on age often went hand in hand with the young person's willingness to disclose. Police officers had different views on the importance of disclosure in determining victimhood. A number of police officers felt that if the young person was unwilling to disclose their experiences of exploitation, there wasn't much they could do. This was despite the fact that they were under the age of 18. 
other officers felt strongly that they should exercise their professional curiosity and spend some time exploring ex exploitation in more depth. General offending histories and previous county lines involvement were also discussed frequently by officers as factors to consider in understanding experiences of exploitation. Some police officers felt that extensive offending histories increased how culpable the young person was for the drug related offences. This was especially true where the young people's offending was thought to have caused serious harm or posed serious risk to their communities. For example, a lot of weight was put on the offending histories of Harry and Daniel when they were arrested because both of them had been linked to the use of firearms. This was thought to reduce the extent to which they could be understood as victims of exploitation. Previous involvement in county lines was thought of in different ways by different officers. Some felt if they'd been previously involved in county lines and arrested for it, the police intervention had provided an opportunity to escape. Therefore, their continued involvement was viewed as a sign they were more entrenched and therefore more culpable for drug-related offences. Others recognised that where there had been arrested previously, they most likely had drugs or cash seized. This meant there was a possibility they were more in debt to those exploiting them and therefore more likely to be viewed as victims of exploitation. All of the factors considered here and the different ways in which each of them were considered illustrates how complicated it was for police officers to make a decision about whether a young person was more likely to be seen as a victim of exploitation or less. Police officers generally find it very difficult, especially because in every case there was a complex combination of factors which mitigated and aggravated the extent to which they could be seen as a victim simultaneously. The quote on this slide highlights that. The police officer starts by saying that the young people were definitely being exploited, citing their age and the fact that no one at the scene seemed to be in charge, but then reflects it's hard to know if they were being forced to do it or choosing to do it in order to get a better life or to earn money. He then also suggests that their lack of fear is potential evidence that they aren't victims. Ultimately, we find that to navigate this complicated process, police officers relied on their gut instinct to make a decision. But crucially, what their gut told them related entirely on their experience of exploitation in county lines cases. Officers on specialist task forces or with a dedicated exploitation role were more likely to understand child criminal exploitation and identify potential indicators of it. In one case where police officers had less experience of county lines and of exploitation, a young person was put at severe risk of harm. When he was arrested, he told officers that drugs had been inserted inside him, that drugs had been plugged. As a result, the young person was taken to hospital but remained under police supervision as he was still under arrest. He had to undergo an operation under anaesthetic to remove the plugged drugs. If they had split, he probably would have died. Social care staff involved in this case were critical of the initial police response and recalled that police officers handcuffed the young person to the hospital bed, which they considered to be an unnecessary use of force. Our finding that experience in exploitation in county lines is vital in informing the decision of police officers has led to a key recommendation, that there is an acute need for regularly updating training for first responders on modern slavery, child trafficking and child criminal exploitation. The scale of this issue means identifying child criminal exploitation cannot rely on the expertise of a specialist task force or exploitation teams alone. We've made other recommendations, as you can see on the slide, for example, involving the CPS, the Crime Prosecution Service, and other agencies to navigate difficult questions or conflicting evidence of exploitation. I'm going to hand back to Jess now, who will share findings around the local authority response to these young people. Thank you, Beth. So the first thing to um, recognize is that local authorities have a different role to police. They are not required to determine culpability and they often would lack the information to do so anyway, although they may be able to provide information to assist police in making such decisions. In contrast to the police, local authorities are therefore less interested in whether a child or young person is the victim within a particular incident and more interested in whether they are a victim in general terms. We considered the local authority response to each incident under two key functions set out on this slide. The first is their function to safeguard against risk in both the immediate and the longer term. And the second is a function to educate, develop skills and build resilience for children and young people. For several of the young people in our sample the local authority safeguarding response 
as Joe has mentioned uh, previously, involve removing that young person into care, often in an attempt to disrupt negative associations in their home area or remove them from a toxic family environment. And for a couple of the young people in the sample, including Ethan, who was placed in secure accommodation under a deprivation of liberty safeguarding order, this proved to be a positive step and gave Ethan the space and support needed to break negative ties. However, our research also found that removing people into care, especially where the placement was a long distance from home or was unsuitable setting, can sometimes have the opposite to intended effect and can place vulnerable young people into risky settings and heighten the likelihood of re-exploitation. And this was true for Stuart, who was removed from his family home in an attempt to change his behavior. Instead, his placement propelled him towards people and activities that cemented his involvement in county lines. And the quotation, um, on the slide there, just on the left, um, is from Stuart's social worker. The other key role played by local authorities in response to a young person's suspected involvement in county lines is to inform them of the risks and harms of exploitation and assist them to develop the skills and resilience to protect against re-exploitation. However, when we spoke to practitioners who were close to these cases, especially those delivering the direct work around exploitation with these young people. So social workers, youth offending team workers and specialist exploitation workers, they commonly expressed a frustration at the lack of available options when young people didn't engage. Given the extent of early risk and vulnerability that I've outlined previously experienced by the young people in this sample, their lack of engagement may be understood more appropriately as a trauma response. For a young person who has consistently been let down by family, moved through care and had negative interactions with police, trusting professionals may understandably be difficult. And in fact, direct work around exploitation uh, will often encourage young people who may have been exploited to reflect on their own position as a victim, a reality that they might struggle to come to terms with and which they may find disempowering. And part of the issue is the absence of any escalation and support offered Many of the 13 young people in this sample were already receiving direct work around exploitation before the incident, and this work continued afterwards, but largely unchanged. In general, uh, arrests, uh, referrals to the National Referral Mechanism and other teachable moments did not prompt a significant gear change in the support offered by local authorities, often because all direct sessions and referral options had already been exhausted. This meant that for several of the young people, once all direct work around exploitation had been completed, services were closed to them, regardless of whether or not the exploitation risk had actually reduced. A tick box approach to the delivery of exploitation support that cannot adapt to meet the dynamic circumstances of a young person's life or acknowledge the likely trauma that informs their disengagement risks retracting support prematurely and increasing the likelihood of re-exploitation. Despite this, many practitioners we spoke to flagged examples of best practice and demonstrated a very clear dedication to supporting the young people they worked with, regardless of the limited options available. Next slide, please, Anna. These often very creative and innovative methods for engaging young people should be shared between agencies and replicated. They include prioritizing the relationship with the young person ahead of direct work, delivering intervention by the strongest relationship and tailoring education to the specific lived experience of the young person. Practitioners and local authorities very often have in-depth local knowledge of the exploitation risk posed to a young person in the wider context of their life experience. This knowledge is absolutely essential to inform decision-making and planning for young people who are at risk or have been exploited. My colleague Joe had already made reference um, at the beginning of the presentation to our recommendation that the National Referral Mechanism localization pilot should be rolled out across England and Wales as exploitation panels. And senior representatives of specialist teams from children's social care and local police have a really key place on these panels to share information and agree joint plans for young people at risk. Beyond this, our recommendations in this section 
to strengthen the safeguarding function of local authorities responding to exploited children include the provision of appropriate residential placements for vulnerable young people who have experienced exploitation and assurance that children who are moved to a placement in a new area are dealt with as a priority and receive immediate support for their physical and mental health needs. We've also made a recommendation that the Department for Education should trial intensive locally based alternatives for care placements based on remand fostering, where older youth workers and community figures are paid in premium to keep potential child criminal exploitation victims safe and with police support. And that rounds off the key findings and recommendations of our report. I'm now going to hand back to Dame Sarah, who is going to take us through um, and chair some of the questions that you've posed to us during this session. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just put my video back on and my um, audio. Great. Thank you very much, team. Uh, lots there, and we've had some good questions coming in. Um, one of the first questions that came in, which is a question which I had asked the team, it was from Selena Wallace, saying, why all boys? Um, aren't there lots of girls uh, involved in county lines? Can, can one of the team explain why we've ended up with all boys in the sample, please? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, so our sample is made up of all males because that was what the police gave us as case studies. Um, girls are known to be involved in county lines, but patterns around their involvement, what that looks like, are less known. We do know that women are less likely to be identified and therefore recorded as involved, which may explain why the police forces gave a sample of all males. Um, I'm just going to pass to Joe, who's got, who wants to add something there. Um, yeah, I, I, I do agree with everything Beth said. Also, in, in our 2020 research into county lines in North Wales and uh, Merseyside, um, we looked at CCE and CSE flagged cohorts um, provided by the police and found them to be implausibly gendered. So the police were very open with us, um, in all fairness, that they were not identifying um, young women as victims of CCE and where they were present they were putting them down a path of CSE. So there, there is an issue of, 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 of gender bias within there, which I think reflects the fact that we were given exclusively male case studies, despite actually requesting a mixture. Okay, thanks, uh, team. So you did try, but uh, in a way you have to deal with what you've got, but it's a really, really important point. Um, it, and it links, um, nicely to a question that Ziba Chowdhury asked about what is the overlap between um, CCE and other forms of exploitation such as child sexual abuse? I'm happy to take that one. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a couple of cases in our research, um, for example, Ben and Sam, where they were known or suspected to have experienced sexual abuse or exploitation, but those incidents were linked to their past, it wasn't actually linked to the instance which we're looking at, which focused on county lines. Um, in one example that I mentioned where drugs were plugged inside a young person, there was evidence of child sexual exploitation, um, but otherwise there wasn't a huge amount of overlap in the cases that we looked at. Okay, so a bit um, of overlap, but not a lot. It would be Don't... interesting um, piece of work to do in the future to look at the uh, uh, unexplained anal um, injuries um, and, and vaginal in injuries for children in hospitals, which may be linked to plugging. Um, and perhaps there's a debate to be had about whether a plug is inserted or removed digitally by a gang member violently, wh whether that should meet the threshold of the current 73 legislation or requires amendments to the legislation. You know, really, really important point there. And uh, Jan Hardy reminded us all about using abbreviations. I know we try hard to avoid them, but I, is there a glossary in the report, Joe? Um, there, there is not, I'm afraid, but oh. it's a good idea. So I think we could, we could possibly look at adding one. Uh, what we try to, to do in the report there. is give the full title yeah, before yeah. we use the abbreviation, and then yeah. we use the abbreviation, but only after we've used the full title. Yeah, that's that's good practice. And of course, uh, 
for those of us very familiar with them, we, we forget that actually it does mean it's not as accessible to other people. Um, now, a really good question here um, about, I think this might be Jan as well, who, yes, who makes the point that um, she can see the case for a much more joined up approach between social care, police, CPS, et cetera. Um, but she's concerned that where she's based, certainly uh, up in Leeds, that actually all those services uh, are struggling uh, with resource levels, uh, making criteria for action higher and tighter. Um, her question, and I'm not sure you got the answer necessarily, it's are, are they going to have access to more resources to enable this? So, so, I mean, I guess what I would like to know, in, as you looked at those cases, to what extent was lack of resource ever evident in the case studies? But then could you try and have a go at answering uh, the question that Jan's posing about what about the resource issue? The, uh, where the children are in care, um, especially in distant placements, vast amounts of money are spent on their care. Um, and I, I'd have to say, given the outcomes for those children, and young people, that money has been wasted. So I think there's huge potential for reallocating how we spend social care placement money um, to have better outcomes for children. And I think, again, to reference the care review that Josh McAllister uh, conducted, I think that point is made in relation to um, um, adolescents. So there, we already spend a huge amount of money on vulnerable young people, but without impact. So I'm not, I'm not one of those people who says just do more with less. I think there are areas where we need more resources. And I, I would say to make a slightly political point, um, I think it's fairly shocking that the Department for Education have been completely absent from the national conversation about county lines um, and have left the national lead to the Home Office, which is in contrast with child sexual exploitation, where the, the, the DfE correctly took, took a lead. So we aren't seeing an allocation of resources or an, uh, an ask to the Treasury from the DfE for issues to tackle county lines. We're seeing that issue being left with the Home Office and Home Office and MOJ budgets have gone up above inflation. Um, there is more money for drug strategy through Carol Black's excellent work. So there is money in the system, uh, but I think it could be used better. And I think there are some players like the DfE who should be doing far more. It's an interesting point you make about DfE and there's their whole responsibility in terms of guidance as well and the extent to which the current statutory guidance really reflects some of these issues and the need for contextual safeguarding, which you argue for uh, very strongly. Um, in terms of the, the, the other point um, that, that you make, um, I do think, I, I, I agree with you completely, um, very important uh, that there is that kind of joined up approach. But, but you know what, what is often the case is that it's easy to spend money when everything's in crisis and gone wrong. It's how do you shuffle the money further up the kind of the, the process to do the early intervention, to do the preventative work, to do the protective work before it reaches crisis and a child has to be taken from their home and put in care. We've got a, a, a very interesting question from Fiona Williams. She said, uh, what came up in the research about the young person being involved in major crime along with their family? Therefore, you know, was there a collusive environment leading to the young person being trapped within it, but agencies struggling to understand that wider context, um, you know, way beyond the kind of trauma and vulnerability. You know, it is a network of trauma and vulnerability which results in wider family being involved. It's hidden from services and almost impossible to uncover. Uh, you know, example, nobody has ever has been arrested in the wider family, although the young person might have been. So it's that sense of, um, lots of thoughts there from Fiona, but collusion between the young person and the family in terms of offending and, and just how hidden and difficult that might be. Is that something that you looked at at all, maybe Jess? Yeah, um, it's a great question. Um, thanks, Fiona. Um, and to, to hopefully try and answer it, three of the young people in the sample were quite explicitly linked to urban street gangs. Um, through familial networks. Um, from the data we received, 
it wasn't always clear to what extent family members were colluding in the young people's involvement in exploitation. Um, there is one case study in our sample, Daniel, um, where when police went to his home to arrest him, um, a family member tried to conceal drugs on his behalf, um, but practitioners were unable to kind of reveal the context more broadly or get to the bottom of exactly the relationship that family members played in the exploitation of the young person. Um, it's absolutely correct that often this wider context is hidden from services, um, and those we spoke to often had quite a limited view of the extent of gang activity or the extent of involvement or had conflicting perspectives um, and different levels of, of intelligence or information on that involvement. Um, and practitioners also pointed to the issue of disguised compliance. So where family members um, appear to be cooperating with services and police, um, but are um, actually uh, kind of working against um, interventions or concealing information. Um, did either Joe or Beth have anything to add on that point that I may have missed? I, I, add, I suppose briefly that it's important to remember that county lines aren't homogenous. So there are lots of different reasons how and why um, children and young people get involved. And, and um, with, without going into talking specifically about geography, um, in, in different parts of the country, it works in very different ways. Um, and I think that's an important thing to note when considering cases like that. Okay, great, thank you. Keith Ditcham says, um, interesting research, which resonates with some of his findings. He's about to submit his thesis. So good luck with that, Keith. I hope it's a good report. And he wants to know, can we have the link? And we put that in the chat already. So Keith, hopefully you found that. Uh, Jan Hardy says, uh, what an informative and well-balanced webinar. Well done, team. Now, somebody anonymously said the lack of girls in a sample highlights the continued lack of understanding how girls are used. Like, I think you probably touched on that. Does anybody want to add to that? Or should we just like that comment stand, which I think we would probably support? Um, I, I think that uh, it's an issue that I, I, would, I would really like Crest to be, to be able to into uh, research in, in more detail. There's a lot of research published about the roles of girls within gangs, um, some of which I think is, is high, high, highly gendered and, and slightly outdated in some respects. Um, so there is a lot of work to be done there. Sadly, we weren't able to do it on this occasion, but I think it is. Uh, okay, well, let's hope you can get some funding to do some uh, work on that. Uh, Nicola Jones says, uh, where is the 2020 North Wales research available, please? Uh, that's available on the Crest Advisory website, crestadvisory.com. Um, and I will, I will post a tweet with a link to it with the hashtag Crest County Lines right away. Great. Thank you for that excellent response. Um, another anonymous person has said, um, whilst it says that children should be seen as a priority when moved out of area with regard to their mental health, however, CAMS won't pick children up until they've been in an area for three months. Is that something that you came across at all in the research? Yes, um, the, the CPS have ra raised this as an issue with us in interviews. Um, they say it's an issue more broad than county lines and CCE, where any victim of exploitation is relocated and has needs for demand-led services, mainly health or education related, they immediately move to the bottom of the list. So we've got a proposal in our, um, uh, uh, in our report, um, slightly further down, not highlighted in the exact summary, that effectively children in that position should be given a golden ticket where they're prioritized for treatment rather than having to go to the back of the queue. Okay, excellent. Um... Habib Akhtar says that uh, he thinks that schools have got a really important role to play in keeping young people safe. Is there a recommendation that schools should do more to support pupils rather than moving them to an alternative provider? Um, yeah, so we, we've, that's absolutely right. Um, uh, we, we found that schools have dealt very badly on the whole with the children in our sample. Um, uh, many of whom had SEN and behavioural issues. Uh, and we think that 
There could be a role for youth offending teams and other agencies and safer schools teams as well um, from police forces in going into schools and actually doing targeted work with vulnerable children um, and those with uh, um, SEN and, and behavioural issues um, to try and maintain their presence in the educational system mainstream uh, as a protective factor. That's great. Somebody has just told us apparently in the West Midlands there is some work being done around a safeguarding protocol for those impacted by forced internal concealment. I don't know if you're aware of that, but thanks for letting us know. Um, and then another interesting thought about has anybody thought about how you'd work with those who've been arrested for exploitation offences against other children to understand more about how it works. So I guess that's thinking about offenders um, so that we can provide some answers to some of the unanswered questions. Um, I don't know whether that's fair yeah, to ask yeah. about that, if you're uh, aware. I mean, so, so this issue, the police describe as the alpha victim issue. I, I, I think this is what's being referred to, where, whereby um, uh, an exploited individual exploits others either um, because it's something they wish to do or, or because they've been encouraged to do or coerced to do it or as a rational response to their own exploitation um, because if they move up the ranks if you like they're less likely to have to do the lower jobs um, and this is an issue which I believe the National Council Lines Coordination Centre are looking at at the moment um, it's something we did come into this research looking for, but didn't find evidence of. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, I think probably all of us would agree it's an important area. Karen Barr says that she finds that remand fostering is a good idea um, and a good way to deal with a lack of placements for a lot of these young people. Um, I think I'll move on because I've got lots of questions. Uh, Graham Bryson says you talk about missing episodes for a significant duration. Do you have uh, an idea about what a significant duration means? Did you have a time period, I suppose, in mind? From, from my perspective, as I, 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 in a previous life, I was a, a lead member for children's services in a local authority, so I'd get missing reports on a regular basis. Um, and, and for me, the issue was always where there was a change, a rapid change. So there can be lots of reasons that children go missing um, uh, to do with uh, their placement, suitability, uh, a relationship they have, some care settings are more prone to reporting missing. Uh, um, uh, some parents will not report missing incidents. So it's a really difficult area of, of data to use as a proxy. But uh, in, in, in my view, changes in duration um, are, are uh, important. So um, changes in, in frequency, interesting, um, but where there's already high frequency, changes in duration are what should really be looked out for. Okay, and there's another question here about missing incidents. How important were the missing incidents for identifying victims of child criminal exploitation? Did the police and local authorities have combined missing and exploitation teams? And if so, was the criminal exploitation a key part of those or were they mainly focused on CSE? The interesting thing about the research that we've done is that when it was only when we were speaking to police and local authorities after the county lines involved what was already known about, that we started to look back and we could see a pattern of missing episodes. But that at the time wasn't necessarily treated as an indicator or a risk factor for county lines involvement. So when you look back at these cases, you can see a pattern definitely, but it wasn't necessarily picked up at the time. Just, um, just to add to what Beth said, in the case of one, one young person, um, and please do read the case studies which are set out kind of in long form as an attachment to the report, but in the case of one young person, um, the missing episodes, he had no previous missing episodes, but then... I believe four missing episodes, which all occurred rapidly within the space of four months preceding the incident, um, which really was the main flag um, around his involvement in county lines. So the point around local authorities and police needing to be alert to not just significant missing episodes, potentially in terms of length of time, but as Jay mentioned, kind of different presentations of missing episodes, escalation in missing episodes. Yep. 
Also, I'd, I'd say from the from a police perspective, um, m missing children um, form a huge, huge part of the work that they do. Uh, they have a huge volume of cases to look at. And if they were able to work more purposefully with local authorities to identify where there is a theoretically higher risk of exploitation because of other factors, they, they would be able to better target that resource because it's been a continual bugbear for the police that they, they feel that they are asked to respond uh, to a huge volume of missing uh, in a way that isn't really practical, uh, meaning that things get missed. The practical thing, and maybe this is for Anna, um, the uh, communications lead. Um, can we send the report to some people by email? Because apparently, um, the anonymous person's local council blocks, the server blocks them, and that must be very frustrating. Maybe we can arrange for that person to get it by email. We can't do it maybe for everybody. Yeah, well, I'm going to send around a PDF um, to everybody who's part of this webinar um, so everybody can access it, hopefully. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, um, Anna, for that. Tabitha Mello makes a really good point about were any of the families involved in the care and decision making regarding provision and delivery? She's saying from her own experience, she said the only way to address some of these issues is if the family is involved. Um, they had to coordinate lots of different moving parts and a very personalised wraparound uh, because she found that families are struggling and very much care about what's happening to their children. But securing prompt access to support is extremely difficult. Did you, any of your 13 cases have evidence of kind of family engagement? Yeah, and um, that's a really um, valid point to make and um, something that we do set out in the report where the families were engaged with police and local authorities, um, asking how asking for help kind of and receiving that help um, and working collaboratively, the outcomes for the young people did tend to be better, where the family environment was acting as a push factor, um, the outcomes for young people tended to be um, less uh, good. Um, so yeah, a very important um, point to raise and something which is picked up on in the detail of the report, which unfortunately we haven't had time to um, touch on in this presentation. So thank you for bringing that up. Great, thanks Jess. And Dean Cody's made an interesting point about asking people who are on the call to try and avoid using the term streetwise when talking about county line children. I'm not sure we've used it today um, because he, was, he says that it's pejorative um, and it can slow down responses. He suggests maybe using the term street exposed or street vulnerable. So kind of interesting uh, point from Dean there. And I, I get the point he's making about it being pejorative. Um, an anonymous attendee said, was poor school attendance an issue with these cases uh, before the um, intervention, the incidents? Jess, you're nodding. <laughs> Yes, it was incredibly um, prevalent, um, not just school attendance, school exclusion, um, and also reports of kind of behavior at schools. Um, again, this is, so this is dealt with in a, in a section of the report in the vulnerabilities chapter, um, but exactly that. And which is why, as, as Joe's outlined, schools are very well placed to spot potentially early warning signs um, of exploitative relationships. And we've got quite a lot of educationalists on the call, which is great. Uh, Caroline Knight has said that education has been removed from the local safeguarding partners. Um, maybe that's where she's based in Devon. This has left a gap in protecting children. She's doing a, a master's um, uh, research thesis on trauma and domestic abuse in the family and subsequent county lines exploitation. And she sees that education clearly is a key factor in the first place and schools have vital intelligence about what's going on is that a kind of a broader than Devon observation we yes can make? yes <laughs> so, so post post the, the the wood review of safeguarding boards um which, which were brought in themselves after after previous uh, uh sort of abuse disasters like the Tariq Columbia um many areas have now moved to a, a sort of a three-legged stall of the police um health and the local authority as an executive group um, I would say that my previous experience within um, uh, a local authority and, and, and within the Tackling Child Exploitation Support Programme is that the contribution of schools within safeguarding partnerships uh, where the boards were full was often fairly poor in that they would 
speak about their own school, but not make a meaningful attempt to aggregate um, the concerns that came from other schools. So if you had two head teachers on a safeguarding board, one primary, one secondary, you, you, you would learn almost nothing from them during a session. So I think we do need to find a way to aggregate the problems that schools are legitimately having um, doing the safe, their Section 11 safeguarding role. But I, I, I'm not sure that the reason for that is the safeguarding boards, which I don't think worked um, particularly well from a, a school. Maybe they work well in that part of the country, but from what, what I've seen, didn't work particularly well. Okay, thanks. I've got a comment from David Burgess, who's a foster carer. And he said we've had situations where a child is missing, reported to the police, but because the child is known to have been previously missing, um, the police aren't as concerned about the child. But in fact, the child was involved in crime and domestic violence. I'll just leave that as a comment. I've then got a question, uh, which is one that we have discussed, is you looked at 13 case studies. Um, how sure, sure are you that your results are valid? given the small sample size. Who wants to take that important question on methodology? I'm happy to take it. Um, so I think firstly, we weren't setting out to make recommendations or statements that were nationally representative, um, but we're focusing on the decision-making in the context of these 13 lines and trying to work out how we can apply that to a wider context. There are two elements to ensuring the validity of our findings. One is even within a small sample size, the table that Jess showed as part of her presentation demonstrates how similar the experiences of the young people are, which provides us with confidence that our findings are valid. Um, and this was also confirmed when we spoke to different local authorities about different young people in different parts of the country, where we're hearing very similar things, which adds to the confidence. Um, and our findings also aligned with what's already published on the topic of county lines, again, providing that extra layer um, of validity. So we can be sure that the recommendations we're making will be relevant um, across England and Wales. I, uh, that's, yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely agree with that and, and, and go further and say that the, the DIP sample is an established method um, uh, uh, of reviewing and learning from, from cases. Um, uh, an individual case review on one child's death, like Jaden Moody, for example, uh, or Corey Davis Jr. can lead to a huge system response. Um, so I think that DIP sample uh, approach is, is useful. I would further say though, that I would dearly love to have access to the um, national database of children flagged with CCE um, to do further study on the whole cohort. Um, it would be fascinating, but unfortunately it's not available. That's good. Um, I've got two questions which are similar. One is anonymous saying about what is the role for third party or charities in supporting vulnerable children? And then George Mayfield asks a very similar question about what role can the community, youth clubs, youth charities, community centres um, play in preventing young people falling into exploitation? Did you find any cases where there was good examples of charities or community organisations trying to support here? Any observations on that? Um, I'm happy to take this one. And um, because we, the interviews that we um, conducted were with local authorities and police, um, rather than representatives necessarily from third sector organizations. We probably are missing that angle to some extent in our findings. However, um, a lot of the practitioners mentioned kind of specialist services and third party services that they did refer the young people to. And what we often found, um, as I kind of alluded to before, these young people in general were very reluctant to engage um, with services, with uh, kind of any support offered, and that included these third party organisations. Where they did, it was often where um, they were able to form a particularly strong bond with um, a worker from the organisation, whether that's because that worker had relatable life experiences and were able to apply those experiences to strengthen the relationship with the young person, or because of the methods they used to kind of develop that relationship. Um, there wasn't kind of a hard and fast um, rule to this. And obviously it depends on the, the life experience and the engagement of that particular young person. But it's certainly um, an important, um, there's an important role for third sector organizations to play in supporting the local authority and the police response. Okay, thanks, that's great. Now we've got um, Lula Machinska is inviting you to agree with her 
um, that a training or curricula for future professionals, whether they're in policing, social work, education, ought to include a better understanding of vulnerabilities and contextual safeguarding. All three of you nodding? I think we can agree with that. Yeah, I think, Lulu, you're absolutely spot on. Um, and then my former colleague, Katie Lawson, so I'd better ask her a question. She's saying, um, have you discussed the findings with the Home Office devolved pilots team? The new Home Secretary apparently has referenced Project Adder as a priority, and the linkages highlighted in your report between vulnerability factors, public health and exploitation would be relevant to inform ongoing work in this space. So have you spoken to anybody in the Home Office yet? Maybe they're on the call today. We, 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 we do have two or three people from the Home Office registered for the call today. Um, we spoke to uh, the team working on, on that initiative when we did the deep dive in December last year uh, in Islington and Camden, uh, and they offered some helpful suggestions uh, and, and clarifications. So yeah, we, we have been able to speak to them. Okay, good, good. And uh, I'm sure that uh, any Home Office colleagues who are on the call will be looking at the report and taking it back and thinking about uh, what it means. Um, Nicola Jones makes a comment, again, back to this education link, which is really interesting. I wonder whether anybody from DFE is on this call today. Nicola says she works in schools as a specialist behaviour teacher, dealing with children who've suffered trauma. And I think the schools need to take more responsibility for the pupils they have, especially looked after children, pupils. They tend to note issues, but don't take it further. And it's left to us to do what they should do. It's a massive safeguarding issue. Much of the changes that need to be made need more funding, although there should be a multi-agency approach. It doesn't always happen as it should. Um, thanks for that comment, Nicola. Any comment from the team on that? I think um, uh, it has been observed before that children often uh, go away for the summer holidays in year eight and come back uh, in year nine a completely different child apparently um, and begin a pattern of exclusions and exclusions accumulate um, for relatively minor um, disobedience or I can't remember what the term used is um, rather than serious policy breaches to the point that they're, they're just allowed to accumulate um, and I, I, I don't understand why a school wouldn't have the, cu the curiosity to engage with other agencies to find out what was going on. I'm sure they may say that sometimes they get a poor response from social services. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that may well often be the case, but uh, I, it, it doesn't seem to be in anyone's interest for a child to just um, uh, accumulate exclusions to the point where they are forced out of mainstream education and therefore have a far worse life as a result. Mm. So um, it's, I'm very conscious of the link to education uh, running through this is quite a, a strong theme. I've got a comment here from Darren Phillips. He says that St. Giles Trust works with a lived experience model and mentor young people involved in county lines and criminal exploitation. Their mentors have been involved in gangs or county lines and build rapport this way. We're now embedded in several schools across London and work closely with them for referrals and support re-engagement with education. Okay, that's great to hear, Darren. That sounds like some good uh, early intervention there. Um, then Darren Ganderton-Smith says, are social media companies likely to be questioned or held to account for the way in which their platforms normalise or glamorise the lifestyle, allow open dealing, often leading to the grooming of young people? I guess um, you, that's a great political question, which you might want to answer, but, but I was very interested in the whole kind of link between kind of social media um, and the cases that you looked at, was that something that kept occurring? I'm, I'm happy to take this one. Um, so we actually didn't have much discussion around social media in the case that we looked at here. Um, that wasn't something that the police or local authorities were largely aware of. There was maybe, there was a couple of examples where police officers checked phones at, at the scene of the incident to see if there was any sort of evidence of exploitation on the young person's phone. Um, but that was as far as any reference in this report. Um, another piece of crash research, um, which was published, I think, in February this year, explored the link between social media and county lines. Um, and there was a good degree of evidence around social media platforms being used to recruit 
and then exploit young people um, over various platforms. Um, and there was a couple of there was a couple of references to apps where messages delete. So even if police officers were looking at young people's phones, there wouldn't necessarily be evidence of that exploitation. So it's certainly a key part of the picture, but not something we touched on in this report. Okay, great. So, so also the, the I'd, I'd add to that the the, the online safety bill. Uh, I think will come back before Parliament when we have a new a new um, function government again, um, and. We would, you know, we would expect and hope that it would cover some of these issues off. Um, the murder of Ollie, of Ollie Stevens is a particular example of how social media can be the cause and the instrument of, of extreme harm. Uh, we have a, a report coming out on that later in, in the year. I would also say that there's a real problem for uh, professionals in that they aren't given guidance on how to engage with young people or protect them from harmful uses of social media because social workers are often told not to use social media to contact young people on their caseload because it's in, it's unprofessional and crosses professional boundaries um, even though the young people live their lives exclusively um, well not exclusively but increasingly on, on social media platforms so we're not clear with professionals when we talk about contextual safeguarding. What about the context of the online space, which is so important? Um, and I think that's a huge unanswered question that the online safety bill could, could attempt to address. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Well, let's see where the new government goes with the new online safety bill. I'm just going to, uh, a couple of people have asked the same question and I'm just gonna answer it myself very quickly because folk are wanting to know where are the case studies from. It was agreed with the police forces that they would be anonymized and it also reduces the risk of ever identifying the children. So that's why um, we won't be talking about where they're from. Um, last question, what are your next steps? What are the next plans, Jo? Um, so we have a piece of uh, research coming out um, in October looking at the future of county county lines so we're looking at the different business models um which I, I shouldn't i shouldn't give too much away about but please do sign up to our newsletter um, and follow us on twitter to find out more about that so we'll be publishing um more on that topic um and i i'd also uh, like to issue a, a public plea to any any government departments out there on this call if you'd like to fund us to do work on what these local panels could look like in detail, I would be fascinated to do that. Um, and I'll certainly be looking for a funder for work to look at how local panels can operate uh, robustly. So we, we're we not gonna walk away from the county lines issue after this um, after this webinar. We It's something that's a, a passion project for us and we'll stay with it. Okay, and uh, can I thank all three of you? The fact it is a passion project is very clear in the way in which you have articulated the report today and for the um, quality of the report and the insight and wisdom it provides us all. So thank you very much. We should also, you mentioned funders, thank the Hadley Trust who paid for this. So thank you to the Hadley Trust. I think you have um, helped uh, move on uh, the debate and shed some light on this really, really difficult issue. So thank you very much. And on a practical uh, point, um, Anna from the team is going to send the slides to everybody so you've got them and she's going to send you a, a PDF copy of the report for those who have uh, difficult uh, work servers. So I think it's now 12.30 which is perfect, it's lunchtime. Thank you all very much, thank you for listening, thanks for the great questions and see you all again soon. Bye bye.